Well, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, everything you've ever wanted to know about tree planting. My name is Franz Hartman. Uh, I'm with Unflood Ontario, a collaborative of community foundations around Lake Ontario and 45 other organizations and businesses across Southern Ontario. Uh, we're collectively dedicated to Unflood Ontario by installing more natural infrastructure. And I invite you to learn more about Unflood Ontario at unfloodontario.ca. Um, this event is being co-sponsored by the Local Enhancement and Appreciation of Forests and Reap, uh, uh, Reap Green Solutions. LEAF is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the protection and enhancement of the urban forest. Uh, LEAF offers programs in the greater Toronto area uh, that help you plant, care, and give. Uh, Reap Green Solutions is an environmental charity that has been helping people in Waterloo Region live sustainably for over 30, uh, 20 years. Uh, REAP offers programs on home energy efficiency, water conservation, healthy yards, and waste reduction, and it empowers participants to take action. As the title suggests, this evening is about tree planting, specifically answering your questions about tree planting. But first, uh, you will get a short introduction to tree planting from one of our tree experts. But before we get to that, let me say a few words about the land I am on and the land you are on. As we stay at home together, we want to recognize that the city of Toronto, which is where I am, is situated uh, on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty signed with the multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. If you're outside of Toronto and are unfamiliar with the territories upon which you reside, I invite you to learn more by checking out native-land.ca. For thousands of years, this land has been the home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. I acknowledge the enduring presence and resilience of Indigenous peoples and recognize their roles as stewards of this land. I, and I encourage all of you to consider the land you reside on and to acknowledge the enduring presence and resilience of Indigenous peoples and their role as stewards of the land. As you know, this evening is all about tree planting and we couldn't have two better people to help guide us. And I'd like to now introduce our tree experts. Uh, Brenna Anstett, Brenna, maybe you could give a wave, uh, is the Residential Planting Programs Manager at LEAF. She is an ISA, ISA certified arborist and holds an honors bachelor of arts degree in geography and environmental governance from the city or from the University of Guelph. She has worked with LEAF for eight years and her past experience includes research in dendroclimatology and tree planting projects with the Ausubel Bayfield Conservation Authority. In her spare time, uh, Brenna enjoys synchronized skating, traveling, photography, and hiking. We also have Chris Morrison. Chris, do you want to give a wave? Um, Chris is uh, Reap Green Solutions Healthy Yards Guide, where he works with homeowners to add trees to their landscapes. Uh, Chris is an ISA certified arborist and an SOUL certified organic land care professional. Chris has three decades of field experience in arbor arboriculture urban forestry and erosion and sediment control. And he is a strong advocate for higher land development standards, which aim to maximize the benefits of living green infrastructure. Welcome Brenna and Chris. Now, before we get to your questions, I wanna turn things over to Brenna to give us a short introduction to tree planting. So with that, I am going to share screen so that uh, Brenna can talk to, sorry, this presentation. And of course, I'm on the wrong slide. <laughs> there we go. All right, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Brenna, uh, and I um, work with LEAF. And before we get started to answer questions, I thought it might be nice to go through um, some things to think about when you're thinking about planting a tree. So an easy way to remember is the four S's. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so when you're thinking about planting a tree, one of the things you want to keep in mind is soil type. Um, and the reason for this is because uh, certain species prefer certain soil types. So you want to make sure you're going to check your soil. Um, you're going to look for the texture of the soil, the color, 
um, to find out whether it's more of a sand, which is kind of grainy, similar to what you see on a beach. Loam, which is darker in color, uh, which means it has more organic matter. A lighter clay, uh, which is lighter in color and sort of sticks together. Uh, or a compact clay, which is really, really tough to dig through. Um, some other things to consider, does your yard get standing water? Is it seasonal, spring only, or does it happen often when it rains? Is the yard quite dry? Um, do you have a large yard? Does the soil vary across your yard? Um, so, so yeah, soil type is the first thing you wanna think of. Uh, next slide. So the second S is sunlight. So what kind of light does your yard receive? And keeping in mind, this can vary across your yard depending what's already existing. Um, so like with soil, uh, species, uh, some species prefer different types of sunlight. So uh, does your yard get full sun? That constitutes as six hours or more of direct sunlight in a day. Uh, partial sunlight, which is generally two to six hours of direct sunlight or shade, which is two or less of direct sunlight. So that'll help dictate which species you're thinking of planting uh, in your space. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the third S is space. So there's a lot of things to consider here. Um, so first of all, ask yourself, well, what do you have in your yard? Do you have a deck, shed, pool, patio, existing trees, um, a second building? Um, and you wanna think about how you use your yard. So do you have kids? Do they like to run around and play in the backyard? Um, you know, do you like to do a lot of gardening? Do you have raised beds? Um, do you host, you know, maybe not right now during COVID, but do you host backyard uh, events? Um, and then you're gonna think about goals for your yard. So what are you looking for when you're planting a tree? Do you want to get shade, privacy? Um, do you wanna save some energy by shading your home? Uh, attract wildlife, and this could be for habitat or food, um, increase your property value. Um, maybe you have a bit of a slope in your yard and you wanna kind of control that erosion that happens. Uh, and maybe if you've got a lot of standing water, you want to sort of manage that runoff. Um, maybe you're planting to honor someone that's either passed away or who's been born, or maybe it's for a birthday or something. Um, food production, and of course, aesthetics. Um, and another thing you want to think about, too, is future construction. Um, are you thinking about expanding your house, uh, building a pool, a deck, a patio, etc.? cetera? Um, larger construction projects, depending on the type of equipment you're using, can really impact a newly planted tree. So it's important to finish all that yard work first before you do the planting. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so just uh, a touch on the space. Uh, so we actually follow some spacing recommendations for smaller trees and shrubs, as well as medium to large growing trees. So some things to think about are, um, if you're thinking about planting a medium to large growing tree, you're gonna wanna have at least 15 by 15 feet of soft ground space. And that space that's free of anything like decks, paving, um, buildings, um, anything that's sort of hardscaping. Um, and then for smaller trees that are only gonna reach maybe about 15 feet at maturity, you're gonna look for more of a 10 by 10 foot of soft ground space. Um, shrubs are, are more of a five by five, but it depends on the size of shrub that, um, that you're planting. Um, something else to consider is the distance from your fence or property line. Our minimum requirement is five feet for trees. Um, and that's to avoid future conflict uh, with you know, the branches growing into the fence or the, the trunk getting wide enough if you're picking a larger growing tree, um, as well as uh, conflict with neighbors. I mean, not everyone has uh, neighbors they get along with, so that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, distance from hard surfaces uh, like decks or paving, we generally keep five to seven feet away depending on the size of the tree. Um, distance from buildings with foundations. Um, so you wanna keep a good distance away from there to allow enough space for root growth. Uh, distance from existing trees. Um, we generally suggest 15 to 20 feet away from existing trees. And while trees do go grow close together in a forested area, in an urban area, um, there's a lot of other factors that go into play and we want the tree to have the best chance at life as possible. Um, and so giving it more space to grow away from larger trees that are taking uh, nutrients and water underground is important. Um, if you've cut a tree down, um, we generally stay about eight feet away from the stumps. Um, and that's mostly because if you're digging by hand, you're going to run into some larger growing roots. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're staying away from those. So you don't, you know, come across, uh, come across those when you're digging. 
Um, and uh, never plant under overhead wires unless it is a small growing species. You don't ever want that conflict. Um, and in raised beds or containers, we don't generally plant, uh, suggest planting trees or shrubs just because there's not enough root space there. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so once you have taken a look at your soil, your sun, and your space, the fourth S is species. So we suggest choosing native. Uh, native species have naturally co-evolved here with animals, uh, fungi, and other plants and abiotic materials prior to colonization. So they've been able to adapt to local soils and climates. Um, and not only that, they help to restore ecosystem functioning and biodiversity. And in the end, they do require lower human inputs, such as you know, watering when it's mature or um, maybe uh, less pruning uh, because they have adapted to this, this area. Um, be sure to match your species to your yard conditions. So when you've assessed your soil and sun and space, you want to pick a species that will fit in that uh, yard rather than picking something that maybe doesn't necessarily match, even though it might look really pretty. Um, you know, we always recommend researching your options. You can talk to local nurseries or experts and always read the tags on any plants before purchasing to ensure that they do match what you've um, discovered in your yard. Um, and I think that is the last slide. Thank you very much for that, Brenna. Brenna, is that available on the LEAF website anywhere if uh, people want it or how, how could they get access to it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I believe that particular presentation is not on the website, um, but I mean, we could probably send it out if someone requests it. Um, we do have information on the LEAF site about um, checking soil and sun. Um, and so, you know, you could direct, uh, find it through the homeowner section. Um, I think it's under the main heading plant on, yourleaf.org. Great. Thank you for that. Okay, so um, now it's time to answer your questions. And what I'm going to do, I'm just checking the chats now. Um, and uh, we've got some hellos from people. What I'd like you to do is uh, enter your question in the, in the Zoom chat. Um, if you're new to Zoom, uh, you'll see at the bottom, uh, there's a, a bunch of icons and one of them says chat. You just press that and you type in what will pop up is a, is a little window to the right and it says type message here and you just put in the message there. So please put your questions in there. Um, if you cannot use the chat feature, as I said before, please raise your hand. Um, what you do is you just press the reactions icon at the bottom and there'll be a raise hand icon there. Just press that and I will get to you um, uh, uh, in, uh, when your turn comes. Now, while uh, you are entering questions, I'm gonna start with the questions that were submitted to us on the Google um, form. And uh, the way I'm gonna do this is I'm just gonna read out the question, then I'll ask uh, Brenna and or Chris to answer it. Okay, so the first question, um, is, uh, well, actually two parters, but um, it says, where can I plant trees? Where do I get seeds or saplings? Chris or Brenna? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start and I know you can finish on this. Um, yes, uh, clearly online is where you're gonna go these days uh, to find sources for, uh, uh, your saplings and for your plants, say you're doing a rain garden or something like that, uh, you're going to find it online because that's just the way things are now. Uh, there are uh, many small nurseries in southern Ontario uh, that grow uh, native trees. And so it's actually pretty easy to find them. Maybe that would be a question uh, for you, Franz to uh, follow up uh, or we can help you with uh, some um, nurseries. The interesting thing is though, uh, a lot of nurseries depend on offshore labor and uh, like from uh, Jamaica, uh, Portugal and whatnot. And they have not had the opportunity to uh, basically grow and repot their plants so there's a shortage this year. So I would say go anywhere locally, you can get a plant. And regardless of uh, what you think its background is, put it in the ground uh, because the benefits of that happening are uh, 
um, more important than uh, the specifics of where it came from. Okay. I can add to that actually too. Um, one site that we find pretty useful, um, it's sort of a directory site, is Landscape Ontario. Um, so if you head over to that website, you can actually type in your address and what you're looking for, and the site will pull up a number of uh, companies or nurseries or, um, you know, uh, uh, companies that could help you out uh, with what you're looking for. Um, and I also um, took a quick, uh, quick look online and um, Credit Valley Conservation Authority on their website, they actually have a uh, native plant nurseries and seed supplier list um, on their website. And so you can go take a look there and see what might be in your area. Um, but, you know, a quick Google search, like Chris said, um, you know, if you're looking for native, native plants um, in my area, you can type in your area, um, usually will, will be helpful um, for what you're looking for. But, you know, as you mentioned, there is quite a bit of a shortage this year. Um, you know, the, everyone is at home. We're finding that people want that privacy because because everyone's home, they want to, you know, get that from their neighbors. And so everyone's looking to plant right now. So just be patient. Um, you know, there is stuff out there, but it might take a little bit of time. Great. That, that CBC site is a good site. And yeah. that list is, is really useful. Yeah, so definitely go there. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so the next question uh, submitted on the forum uh, is as follows. I would like to plant fruit trees in my backyard. What type of tr types of trees and what would you recommend as best practices to do this? Yeah, I can, I can start. Um, well, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, you wanna make sure you're checking your soil, sun and space because that can dictate um, what you're looking to plant because there are a variety of different fruit trees that range from really small to really tall. So you wanna make sure you have the space for the larger growing ones. Um, something else to think about too is um, some fruit trees require two trees for cross pollination. So, you know, depending on the species you're looking to plant or the type of fruit you're looking to plant, make sure you know if you need one or two trees, or if you're purchasing a cultivar, you know, they might have grafted both of them onto one tree, but it's important to, to look into that first. Um, you know, fruit trees generally require a lot of extra care um, than a regular, you know, backyard native tree. And so um, there's a couple of websites actually, I would recommend that if you're specifically looking for fruit tree care, um, not far from the tree and orchard people are two great um, groups that might be able to provide you with some uh, additional care resources specifically for fruit trees. Great. Uh, the next question is, I planted three trees in my yard one and a half years ago and have diligently watered the new trees since then through the spring, summer and fall. I don't know what to do now about watering. Thanks. Well, fair enough. Uh, I'll take that one. Um, it's, there's no uh, prescription for doing this. Uh, what you can do and it's super cheap. It's just go get yourself a indoor plant meter, uh, moisture meter, and use that in the ground outside. Um, I it's been years since I bought them, but they're probably twenty bucks or less, and it gives you an indication. And it's 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 not uh, fancy. It's either wet, uh, moist, or dry, but it gives you an indication. For instance, if you push uh, the probe into the ground and you snap it off, you know it's dry, right? So you can use these things, but uh, use uh, uh, mulch and other land covers uh, to ensure that uh, the moisture is staying in the soil. And, and I don't over mulch for sure, uh, but make sure that you have that ground covered in a way that the moisture is being retained in it. And other than that, it's honestly your call, and um, and Brenda probably knows this is probably one of the biggest exits of a newly planted tree is overwatering. So it's something you really want to be careful of. Absolutely, yeah. We we usually recommend if you're looking for a bit of a, like Chris said, there's not really a, a specific. Uh, prescription, but for younger trees, maybe from planting to two to three years old in the ground, we usually recommend um, 
it, up to six gallons of water twice per week. So that's the equivalent of three full two gallon watering cans uh, twice per week. And then um, you could either use a hose on a slow trickle with no nozzle for about 15 minutes twice a week. Um, and that should be good. But again, if you're ever unsure, what you can do is you can stick your finger in the soil just underneath the mulch. If it feels wet, you're probably good to leave it for another day. And if it feels dry, your tree's probably in need of a drink. Um, when it's really hot out, like the 30 degree weather we've been having, you could increase that to three days a week. But, but as Chris mentioned, overwatering um, can happen as can underwatering. So it, it's good to maybe check that mulch, um, the soil under the mulch, you know, twice a week, just to make sure that you are, um, you are fulfilling the watering needs. Uh, if it rains steadily for a full day, that can generally count because it'll be more of a deeper soaking. Um, the flash rainfalls and uh, that you know that where it floods generally doesn't soak into the ground. It'll typically run off, so it may mean that you do have to water not too long after that. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, and then usually when the tree gets to be about three years after planting or so, um, you can kind of switch to a you know check on a need to basis if it's if it's been dry for a long time. Get, you know, give it a bit of a drink. And if not, um, by that point, the root system should have developed. Um, I usually find that in the first couple of years after planting, that's when the um, their roots system is really taking time to develop. So you might not see a ton of upper growth in that time. And that's because the, the roots are um, rooting themselves, I guess, in their new home. So the watering in the first two, three years after planting is super important. Great, we've got one final question from the uh, Google form and then we've got a whole bunch of questions lined up through the chat. And the final question is how do you, how to decide where to plant in a community? Well, okay, but, Brenda, that's yours. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, it's a bit vague, but um, I guess the first thing to consider is are you looking to plant on private property or public property? Because that can really dictate the rules. I mean, if you're looking to plant on your private property, uh, you know, as long as you're taking into consideration all those spacing requirements to make sure that the tree is going to actually thrive long term, you can really plant, you know, what suits your property. Um, if you're looking to encourage your neighbors to plant, you could always, you know, drop a brochure or send them an email or something with um, links to places like Leaf or Reap or, you know, other um, companies in your neighborhood that do planting um, just to encourage them. Um, maybe talk about about the benefits of trees, you know, what can trees do for an entire community? They can provide shade and noise reduction, that stormwater runoff management, um, you know, um, they, the leaves can collect pollution, so it helps to clean the air. You can provide um, habitat and food for wildlife. So, you know, it's important to talk about the benefits, but if you are looking to plant on public property, so in like a, a park or something, you'll have to touch base with your um, individual municipality to ensure that that's something you're allowed to do. Um, if you're looking instead of uh, planting, but maybe to take care of trees, again, you can reach out to the, the local municipality or if you've got any um, uh, park subgroups, um, they might have an adoptive park uh, program where you can go and mulch and water um, to care for the trees that are already existing. So yeah, it's just, a, it's, a, it's about checking in with uh, who owns that property um, before you actually do the planting. And just a side note, if you are planting on your own property, call before you dig. Um, Ontario One Call is the underground utility locate sort of uh, central place. Um, and you do have to have those by law before you dig. Great. Thank you. And uh, before I get to questions, just a couple of uh, relevant chats. Uh, City J Cindy just said, always look up before you plan to avoid power hydro lines, right tree in the right place, here, here. Yeah. Um, and we do have uh, fruit tree resources in there. And the first kind of comment, which wasn't quite a question, but um, no offense meant, but a lot of nurseries don't necessarily <laughs> quote, go for native species. Um, so, okay, the first question is, um, I have four giant catalpa trees, I hope I pronounced that properly, that me and my neighbors do not enjoy. Three are on city property. Is there any way to appeal to the city to remove them so I can plant something native and less of a nuisance? I'll take that one. Um, it's interesting. We have 300 years of history of colonialization here. 
and uh, we deforested this area. And most of the areas that we live in uh, are in those areas. And we have very poor soil, soil quality. And it's interesting because uh, it brings up the whole idea of ecology and what's appropriate and what's not appropriate for this area. Uh, nature doesn't understand our idea of appropriateness and will vegetate anything. And so if you've got anything growing, regardless, and it, it may not be something you really want, it's actually adding uh, significant benefits to the environment. So nature does not like bare soil. It'll grow anything. We brought a lot of things over here from uh, Europe and other places that may not make sense in the long term. But here's the thing, but we, we have to watch it because there's a lot of uh, non-native uh, species that are actually doing stuff for us that our natives can't do because our natives are not actually adapted to uh, some of the areas we're planting them in. And I'm talking about highly urbanized areas. So if you have the benefits of these trees, maybe we should be looking at the benefits of these trees. And those trees, for sure, are messy. They're messy. Uh, they're odd with their big leaves and whatnot. And they don't seem to be what you want around here. But they're actually providing a lot of services. So uh, you'd want to make sure that the removal of those trees is going to be balanced by some kind of improvement uh, over their absence. So that, that's what I would say. And I know that's a tough call, uh, but uh, I think it's an important one. Thank you for that, Chris. So the next question is as follows. I know this is about tree planting, but if you don't mind, I have a question about maintenance. We purchased a house that has a mature Japanese maple, which was planted too close to the house. It reaches into the porch. It isn't close to the main foundation. When is the best time of the year to prune it? Is it okay to take off a rather large branch at once, or should we take a few of the branches, a few, a few of that branches, smaller ends off one year, then wait a couple of years to take the rest of the branch back to the trunk? Thank you. Yeah, I can take this one. Um, so the first part of the question, uh, the best time of year to prune is early spring and late fall. And so that's when it's not as hot, the leaves aren't generally on the branches, so you can see the structure better. Um, and the tree is not uh, super active in its regular, you know, when it's fully leaf photosynthesis, so it's a better time to prune. Um, in terms of how much to take off, the ISA, which is the International Society of Arboriculture, recommends um, no more than 25% of the canopy at one time. So if that branch is more than that, then you would want to take it back in smaller steps, um, one a bit one year and a bit the following year. Um, but if it's less than 25% of the full canopy, then you can take it off um, all at one time. Um, and if you do search, um, search ISA, um, pruning trees. Um, they've got some really great um, PDF resources on their site showing you the proper equipment, um, you know, best time to prune, how to make those pruning cuts without hurting the tree. Um, you can also search it on um, treesaregood.org. It's another website that's tied with the ISA. And it's got some really great pruning resources on it as well. Right. Another thing to mention on top of uh, what Brenna said is uh, when you do have a tree planted that close to a, a structure, uh, you're probably looking at uh, managing uh, the demise of the tree or removing the tree at some point. So there's no perfect answer uh, for um, dealing with keeping that tree and the canopy. And we did that uh, for so many years, planting trees very close. Uh, but you will be removing branches which are direct injuries to the tree, which ultimately results in its decline. So in, with uh, urban trees, and uh, especially large ones, we're always managing uh, their decline in the environment. That's basically what we're doing. So we're trying to get the trees up to 
uh, maximum size so we get the benefits of them. But when you have a tree planted close to your house, uh, you're probably going to be um, managing its removal over time. Okay. Thank you. So next question, is it too late in the season to transplant a small burr oak? I guess that would depend where it's coming from because uh, and the size of it, right? So that's kind of a very open-ended question. Uh, but if you're a caregiver and the tree needs transplanting, uh, I would say uh, go for it. So yeah, you're weighing. You're weighing. Uh, is it going to be beneficial to leave the tree there and ultimately have a larger issue with removing it or transplanting it, or do I do it now? And yeah. definitely, I would do it in the summer months. But if you are, if you can't do it now, you can root prune it. So basically, just uh, outside. Uh, whatever diameter you think you can physically move, if you're moving it on your property, uh, you can cut the roots and they will regenerate over time. And then you try to dig a larger uh, diameter to save those roots and, and move it and you can do it in the fall. And uh, honestly, if you're, you're looking at a small tree and you think it needs to be somewhere else, don't leave it for another year or two uh, because ultimately it become too big and either it has to stay or you're going to take it down. Uh, yeah. So I would just say, uh, go for it. I have no idea what size of the tree is, <laughs> but I would say uh, go for it, but you've got to be a caregiver. Great. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. I was going to say, obviously the best time to do it is early spring, late fall, but um, Anytime you can dig into the ground and you can water, as Chris said, it's probably better to do it do it now rather than letting it get too big. Great. So we're coming up to 735. We're gonna go on until eight o'clock. We got lots of questions still, so I'm just gonna keep plugging away at them. Uh, the next question is, how old does a tree need to be before I cut off lower branches to encourage canopy growth rather than a big quote shrub un, uh, unquote look. Specifically, I have an oak that ha had its primary leader broken off by, by snow load. I'd like to train a secondary branch to replace it, but, now, but right now it looks more like a shrub with branches coming off the entire length of the trunk. Should I wait until the new leader is strong before trimming off the lower branches? Do you want that one, Brenna, or? Uh, yeah, I, I can touch on that. Yeah. Um, I guess it depends on how much of the tree was damaged um, and how much canopy was taken off um, or if it was just the single leader. Um, but if there is uh, less uh, foliage available right now, keeping those lower branch branches on now is probably better because the tree is going through a healing process and it needs to be able to access um, as much leaf area to photosynthesize as possible. Um, but if it was just a small break, I mean, obviously that main leader is being broken is not ideal, but to train a new one, um, you know, at any time I would say removing lower branches, if it's not newly planted, so like between the first and second year or so after planting, it's probably okay. Years three to five or is more when you're gonna look at that structural printing stage and then five years after planting or older, um, of course, again, you're going to not take more than the 25% off. Um, but yeah, I guess it, it would depend on how much foliage was lost with that break. Um, Chris, did you, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, well, no, I think you covered it there. Uh, I think <laughs> um, if, if you can give it a year after that leader was gone, you can see what, uh, how the true response so it's going, to, it's going to respond. It's going to try and replace that leader. And so it might become clear after a season or maybe two uh, what the leader is you want to encourage uh, moving ahead. And, and the tough thing about pruning is always an injury. The tough thing is uh, in an urban context anyways, is just making sure that some of those lower branches uh, which can really compete with the upper canopy 
uh, don't get a chance to outcompete whatever leader takes over. So uh, in that case, uh, you may have to prune some of the lower ones, and and that's um, it's not the kind of cut we like to do, uh, but it can really encourage uh, the vertical growth. So yeah, maybe just give it a, a season or two and see uh, what leader is going up there. And then watch carefully for what's competing because when your tree's young, that's the time to prune it. it it's the smaller injury to your tree than 20 years from now. Great, thank you for that. Um, next question, what kind of mulch do you recommend in the fall? We want to avoid mulching our own fallen trees as they may have important pollinator eggs hidden inside to overwinter. Is it better to purchase a commercial mulch? Well, that mulch is a, a huge uh, subject. Um, but for instance, uh, uh, garden centers love to sell uh, cedar mulch. Cedar mulch is amazing. Everyone loves it because it doesn't break down, but it has a lot of uh, uh, chemical compounds in it that came from the trees that inhibit uh, microorganisms, uh, beneficial fungi and bacteria because there's a defensive part of the tree. So you have to be careful uh, with mulch, ideally. Uh, get, uh, if you can get, you don't have to use mulch, you can also use compost. But uh, a composted hardwood mulch uh, is probably the thing that is least invasive for putting out and then not over mulching, going really easy, two inches of mulch, knowing that you're going to replace it uh, over time. Uh, but that's, that's the thing. We love our cedar mulch because it breaks down so slowly, uh, but it impairs uh, the, the microbial action in the soil, which benefits your trees. Okay. Um, Ashley just added a comment that said, my favorite mulch is straw. It helps amend the soil plus acts as a mulch. Inexpensive and local farmers love you for it. My garden is a thin strip, of a, uh, strip at the end of a gravel parking lot. Okay. Um, so we've got one more question left. Um, so for those of you on the call who have, um, uh, who have a question, even if you've already asked one, feel free to, uh, to ask some more. We've got about another 10 or so minutes left. So um, uh, you know, just put them in the chat box. Um, the last question I have is we lost six ash trees to the EAB, Emerald Ash Borer. These trees were huge. Can you recommend a tree that will grow well in a spot that ash trees loved so we can start regaining our shade? Is that an urban contact, context or is that a woodlot context? I guess that would be one of them. Um, I'll let Brenda take over with this because uh, it's much more of an issue in the GTA. Uh, but when we lose a large ash, it it does what nature does ecologically. It allows a lot of room for um, what we might call early succession plants and trees to move in, which are not the native ones. And so when we lose a big ash tree, uh, it's a space for what you might call invaders. Uh, but then that depends on uh, your definition of ecology, but that's a huge challenge. Yeah, I think it also, like you mentioned, depends on the amount of space available um, for replanting because you look at some species like fir oak, um, black walnut, uh, sugar maple, um, hackberry, basswood, like they're going to get pretty big, um, but you want to make sure that you've got the space um, to replace them. I assume since there are six ash trees, there is a lot of space um, available for planting. Um, so yeah, so you just, you, again, you'd, you'd, um, you'd have to make sure that you've got sunlight available. Um, if you're looking to plant something like a fir oak, it likes a lot of sunlight. Um, again, it also depends on the soil too. So some, some of the hardier species that can withstand uh, more of a compact clay 
or down to a sandy soil fir oak, hackberry, um, honey locust. I, again, like honey locust is sort of cusp native. Um, uh, you know, sugar maple may be on the cusp of compact, but if, if, if it's clay, it should be okay. Um, the basswood, um, yeah. If you're looking for a whole list of natives specifically, um, take a look on our website, yourleaf.org. Um, if you navigate under the plant uh, section, you'll see a, um, a dropdown called species offered. We have a list of everything we offer through our programs. And if you click on each species, a profile will pop up with more information on that specific tree. So it also depends, I guess, on, on what you're looking for. If you're looking for more of a dappled shade or more of a dense shade, um, that can change what species you end up choosing as well. Okay, thank you. Um, we have uh, just a comment that came in. Don't know about other municipalities, but St. Catharines is a free tree giveaway each year. They're all Carolinian forest, uh, Niagara type trees and get grabbed up super quickly. Maybe all municipalities should think about doing that. Great suggestion. And I know that there are a lot of municipalities, increasing number actually, that are involved in, in uh, annual uh, tree planting um, uh, programs. So uh, regardless of where you are, um, just check your local municipality on the website. And if you don't find anything there, just call a number, call someone and ask, and invariably they will point you towards someone, an organization It could be a equivalent of LEAF um, or REAP that does tree planting. Um, we have another comment, re-EAB, Emerald Ash Borer, just wondering if arborists, scientists, or others have saved seeds and whether it will be possible to reintroduce the ash trees at some point in the future. Great question. I don't know, Chris, if you know a bit more about this, I'm not sure. Um, I would assume that they're, they're probably collecting seed. I know there was some, some issues just a while back with the, um, the seed bank, um, but Chris, if you know a bit more, you might want to touch on that. I don't know much more other than uh, um, it, it became clear that our, at one time, our only hope was uh, it seemed to be in the family, the blue ash, and then uh, we lost kind of hope with it, but now I have heard, and I have no, it's just anecdotal, uh, that the blue ash may actually uh, be starting up. And uh, we are we are getting uh, ash seedlings uh, growing up. And uh, so it, it's kind of the elm tree uh, repeat to a degree, other than it was way faster and way massive. So. Yeah, actually, I don't know, uh, but at this point, uh, 60, 70 years in after uh, starting with the uh, elm um, loss, uh, we now have really pretty good trees that we can depend on that we're growing elm trees here again. So it could be another 20, 30, 40 years before we're growing uh, ash again, but uh, the diversity of having trees in our canopy is so important because we're just so out of trees uh, to offer up and especially in an urban context. So hopefully, yeah, that goes forward. That's all I know. Great. So the next question will require you, Chris, and you, Brenna, to kind of peer into your, into your, um, your, uh, 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 peer into the future and try to figure out uh, what's going to happen. The question is, do you think the gypsy moths will be awful next year? Well, I, I'll, I'll take the first shot at that and I'm going to say okay. yes. yes. Uh, they were awful last year and uh, I, I, we, we're probably, this is the biggest infestation we've had of them. But uh, it's interesting though, over time, as we've had all these infestations, the um, biodiversity in our landscapes is being reduced and the biological diversity in our soil is being reduced over time. I'm wondering, and I don't know, but I'm wondering if that's having an, an effect on trees response uh to these infestations 
but that that's just my guess. Uh, based on egg masses this year, I would say we're in for another really big year. And uh, they're not just going after our oaks, our red oaks or whatever. Uh, they're after sugar maples. I've even seen them defoliate uh, white pine, which I, I have never thought that that would ever occur. But uh, And that's up all in a basically uh, natural forest areas as well. So it's not just an urban thing. Yeah, no, I totally agree. We're seeing it on birches as well this year. I don't know if you've seen that, Chris, but uh, oh, yes. a lot yeah, of birches are getting hit. Yeah, I got a call today on that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, those are all the questions that you've submitted. Um, I will um, ask uh, all of you again, if you have any final questions for Chris and Brenna, um, please just put them in the chat. And uh, while that's, uh, while we're waiting for any final questions, I'll just, um, I'll just uh, maybe throw it to, to, to Chris and Brenna. I mean, both of you have been at this a long time. You've seen a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, tree planting, good, good examples, bad examples. Any other kind of just pointers you want to uh, 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 leave? And in fact, before I get to that, there, there is another question. So in the back of your mind, you know, final thoughts perhaps. Um, uh, another question, is there anything to do to help a birch tree that appears to be dying from the top? Uh, that's a great question, um, and it's it's a, also a hard one to answer. But generally, when you see dieback from the top in, it has to do with the root system. So I don't know if there was construction happening in that area, if roots were cut somehow, um, or if the, the roots are girdling um, and circling around the tree. But generally, dieback from the top in is usually a root uh, a root issue, and the effects on the canopy usually happen a year or two or more after the damage to the root has been done. So, you know, maybe they're going back a bit further, there was something that happened. Um, but yeah, it's hard to say without seeing the tree in person, without seeing the environment and, and what else is going on um, around. But I guess um, generally regular watering, adding some organic compost to help provide some additional nutrients to the roots um, would be two things that uh, I would recommend without knowing the background situation. Yeah, I, I would definitely add to that. Um, and we don't know the age of the tree, right? So yeah. uh, we don't know if it was uh, planted in a wire basket with a burlap liner. We don't know if it was in a container, uh, but moving forward, uh, for all of us, now that the industry is chosen, uh, the go-to containers. Um, this is a challenge, and uh, if uh, you know how to plant a tree, you can deal with them. Uh, but if a homeowner buys a tree from Walmart or a, or a, a garden center, uh, they're not going to necessarily know that they have seriously uh, circling roots and possibly the tree's uh, root system is way too low in the pot. And so, um, and this happens with municipalities too, and when they plant their trees. So there's some things you can rule out um, easily uh, if you know about them. And, and that's the circling roots because you can deal with that and being low in the pot, you can deal with that. Uh, but beyond that, uh, the industry has gone in a direction uh, to provide plants that can grow not in the field, uh, but in containers, and they can grow them much quicker. And in, in a sense, they become weaker trees. And when, when they plant them in the ground, uh, it causes grief. And we're left. By default, I'm going to say that 80% of the trees that we have offered to us now are in containers. And the beauty of them is they're lighter, easier to carry. And uh, a homeowner or uh, a small landscaper can, can plant 
decent sized trees, uh, but it's not serving as well at all. Uh, if we're looking at the longevity of these trees in um, urban environment. So anyhow, that's a conversation to have with uh, tree growers and uh, garden center staff. Uh, but if you ever get a tree in a container, make sure uh, you deal with the circling roots. And you cut them and make sure you check where the root flare is uh, in the container because we're planting trees. It's, it's not aware, awareness that um, it's the way we grow trees. So it, it's uh, income stream. Basically, that's what it is. And it's not serving as well. Okay, so we've got time for one more um, uh, one more question, and it's a nice, simple yes or no. I think should lower spruce branches be pruned to keep them from touching the ground? I think that 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 could be a personal choice, um, depending on if you're wanting that spruce to create some privacy. A uh, lower branching helps you to maximize that, um, but you'll probably see as the spruce matures that the inner branching is going to die back anyways due to lack of sunlight. So I guess it depends on um, if you want to remove some of the dead stuff, then yep, you can absolutely prune up. But at that point, I think um, if the branches aren't broken, dead, diseased, or dying, it's a, it's a personal choice um, uh, in terms of whether or not you want that for privacy or not. Great. And uh, a big, uh, just a couple of last comments. You need to give this course to developers who plant non-native species in monoculture and subdivision and too close to the house and agree with comment about developers. Sigh. Yes. Well, listen, we are at 755. Um, it's incredible how fast that hour went. Um, thanks so much to all of you for your great questions and to Brenna and Chris uh, for great answers. And before I wrap up, I wanna give Brenna and Chris an opportunity to make any final comments on what they heard today. I think, I think it would be these were great questions. I guess one little last thing I can leave you with is just a quick little tip. Um, tree roots do not mirror their canopies. Um, so when you're thinking about planting or if you've got an existing tree, please keep in mind that tree roots extend two to three times the width of the canopy they don't necessarily go down deep. They're generally, most of them are found in the top 50 centimeters of the soil. Um, so just remember that when it comes to, to planting a new tree, providing that tree with enough space so that it can actually grow well, thrive um, and get to its mature size so that it can provide you with all those great benefits I touched on earlier. Great. Chris, any final thoughts from you? Yeah, completely uh, just a dovetail with that is, uh, where your tree roots grow generally in a urban setting is in turf. So uh, be aware that your turf maintenance practices really affect the well being of your trees, as well as the well being of your turf, and as well as the, your stormwater infiltration. So, and anyone knows me, uh, you know what? I will say this raise your mower deck as high as it can go because it will cool the soil. Keep the beneficial fungi and bacteria, which give your trees and your turf their trade associations of nutrients and water, keep them from going dormant uh, when you get into hot weather. So raise your mower deck. You'll end up cutting way less grass. Your trees will do better. Your turf will do better. And of course, everything's connected. Great. Well, thank you so much, Brenna and Chris. Um, that's it. Um, before we sign off, I would like to remind you to visit um, unfloodontario.ca. The website is a great, uh, has, has great resources on it to, uh, to help you learn more about natural infrastructure. And most importantly, what you can do at home and in your community to get more natural infrastructure in the ground. Uh, we've got uh, fun short videos on it, what, videos that are designed for people who don't know a lot about natural infrastructure and it gets them, it explains it to them in simple ways and gets them engaged. And they're great to share with your friends and your family, uh, even younger people, just to introduce them to the many, many benefits of natural infrastructure. 
Um, our plan is to post the recording of this evening's event on the Unflat Ontario website. And I understand that Reap Green Solutions and Leaf may also post this on the website. So stay tuned with that. Uh, thanks again to Leaf and Reap uh, Green Solutions for co-hosting this event. And thanks to each of you for helping us unflood Ontario together naturally. Be well and have a great evening. Good night. <laughs>